Um, anyways, uh, folks, first of all, I apologize because I am not very organized and uh, I'm not super prepared. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I'll try to give a um, brief review uh, on my research. And at the same time, I'll try to give you a little bit of uh, uh, conformal geometry introduction uh, together with uh, yeah, another introduction to uh, ambient matrix construction that was uh, given by uh, two famous mathematicians, Robin Graham and Charles Pfefferman. Uh, Charles Pfeffer Pfefferman, he's probably one of the finest mathematicians of our time. He's still alive. Um, yeah, let's see, I mean, how much materials I can cover. Um, I don't know. As usual, I'm very optimistic. I am plan to cover a lot of things. Let's see. Okay, how uh, can I share my screen? Uh, I can do that. Uh, on it, but I need your permission if I want to share my screen. Can somebody give me permission so that I can share my screen? Oh, now I can. Okay, uh, can, can, can you see my screen? Yes. Someone's yes. Screen? Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, you can see <laughs> I'm basically sharing my PDF. Uh, uh, it's still under process. Uh, it's not completed. I need to add um, citation and uh, still there are some uh, grammar and uh, yes, uh, some of the proofs are not, uh, uh, I mean, very well written, uh, they're, they're complete. Uh, so this is the title of my talk, uh, Linearized uh, Stability of Bach Equations. Um, if you're not familiar with Bach Equations, uh, let me briefly tell you what it is about. Um, um, so we, we have um, uh, Einstein's field equation in four dimension. Um, uh, let, let's say um, uh, we are uh, talking about empty space Einstein equation. Uh, uh, by the way, whenever I say empty space Einstein field equation, I mean my cosmological constant either could be zero or non-zero, doesn't matter. But um, I am forcing uh, my uh, energy momentum tensor must be zero. That's my definition. Whenever I say empty space, Einstein's field equation. Um, uh, just this, a uh, quick question, Milan, hey, uh, is it uh, like uh, essential to consider vacuum Einstein equation or just a technicality? Uh, I mean, uh, it's essential uh, for my proof. Yeah, yeah, for, um, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's required. Okay, thanks. Um, then we have our uh, empty space Einstein field equation, and we try to understand the solution space. Um, uh, uh, you guys know, um, finding weird kind of solutions is rare. For example, um. Uh, the flat metric uh, is a solution of, I mean, by flat, I mean uh, uh, Minkowski space, uh, the flat Minkowski space. By space, I mean the metric G. That that guy is a solution. Uh, what, uh, since, uh, since uh, 
Einstein's field equation is a very complicated system of PDE. It's not a single equation. By the way, sometimes I will say equations, sometimes I will say equations, uh, but you, you should understand, I mean a system of equations. It's not a single PDE. Um, since it's a very complicated second order PDE, uh, um, finding solution space, uh, another way of saying, uh, finding the kernel of the operator is pretty difficult. So what we try to understand, uh, we try to understand the nature of solution space. Uh, uh, if you have read my uh, abstract, uh, three mathematician, um, uh, I don't know why they're called applied mathematicians. They, uh, they should be pure mathematician. Um, Fisherman, Marsden and Moncrief, um, they proved like uh, seven or eight papers from 1973 to 1982. Uh, they basically characterized, uh, uh, characterized this linearized, linearization of stability of Einstein's field equations uh, at a given solution. I mean, uh, if you have a solution uh, to your um, system of PDE and you perturb your solution a little bit, what happens? And under what condition uh, your uh, given solution is linearization stable? Uh, another way of saying uh, your PDE is your linearization stable. Uh, also, they found the um, solution space is not that bizarre. Uh, solution space almost like a manifold, almost. If you consider all like all the solutions, it's almost like a manifold with a little bit of um, uh, singularities. Uh, those are like uh, so-called uh, conical singularities, like very natural singularities. Think about the cone and the tip. So th th those kind of singularities, those are like very easy to deal with singularities. Uh, other than then, uh, the solution is space, space is everywhere manifold. Roughly speaking, very naively speaking, uh, solution is space is almost manifold. Uh, that that's what what they did. Um, what I am uh, trying to do, I'm trying to prove. Uh, some kind of similar results for Bach equation. Bach equation is a little bit complicated than Einstein's field equation in some sense, uh, because uh, Bach equation is a um, fourth order P system of PDE. Uh, Einstein's field equation was like second order PDE. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, in physics literature, people say a uh, higher order PDE. Um, uh, in some sense, it's complicated, but it has nice properties. Um, for example, um, um, yeah, uh, for example, uh, remember that uh, the way uh, Einstein's field equation um, we derive, uh, people derive these days, uh, is from the so-called Hilbert-Einstein action. You just take the uh, integral of your uh, scalar curvature and uh, this is your action, Hilbert Einstein action, and you try to find the corresponding Euler Lagrange equations. That is basically your um, Einstein's field equation. Uh, what you do when you try to derive Bach equation, your action is so called Weyl action, or sometimes physics people say um, conformal gravity action, which is you take the inter uh, you take the square of Weyl curvature and you integrate over the manifold. By the way, uh, whenever I say you integrate over the manifold, uh, like uh, you think about your space time is compact, like you do nice restriction so that the word integral makes sense. Uh, if your space time is not compact, then you do some other things. Uh, you take Cauchy surface. I mean, you, you take three dimensional slices. Those are, uh, uh, those are compact. Uh, yeah. and. Um, I mean, at, at, at some point, you assign some boundary on your four, uh, four manifold to talk about integration. Uh, it's not uh, infinity, uh, like infinitely extended, then integration will be nonsense. Anyways, um, so uh, while, 
uh, the action of wild gravity, uh, the main thing, uh, I mean, the Lagrangian uh, of your action, which is uh, the norm of, by norm, I mean tensor norm, norm of the wild, wild curvature square has nice properties. Uh, for example, uh, scalar curvature is not conformal invariant. Uh, I'm going to define in a moment what do I mean by conformal invariant. Uh, on the other hand, um, while tensor is conformal invariant, and well, I'm not super correct. It's conformally covariant with weight minus two, but I mean, that doesn't matter uh, in terms of equation. Uh, if you have a tensorial function, some tensor equals to z z zero. If you have some function, like functions time tensor equals to zero, they're the same thing. Um, um, yeah, so the wild tensor is conformal invariant, and what happens, the whole action is in fact conformal invariant only in four dimension. That's that's the critical point. Um, uh, it's conformal invariant only in four dimension. And it's a one line proof. I'll show you the proof. Um, and by extension, what we have, the corresponding Euler Lagrange equation is conformal invariant. I mean, um, a while, um, uh, I mean, the Bach equation, the, the corresponding Euler Lagrange equation is exactly Bach equation. Bach equation is conformal invariant. I mean, Bach tensor is conformal invariant. Um, well, let me, let me uh, summarize what I said uh, for the last two minutes. Uh, in some sense, um, Bach equation is quote unquote, uh, uh, better kind of equation for gravity uh, from mathematicians point of view, because uh, uh, in terms of conformal behavior, um, Bach equation is nice. Um, so that's, uh, this is basically one of the mm, reasons uh, Sorry, can I, I ask am a interested. Question? Sure. Uh, what is the Bach equation? It, I mean, I understand it's the equation that comes from the Wall uh, Lagrangian, uh, Wall squared Lagrangian, right? Um, but what is, uh, is it the equation? Yeah, I, 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 I'll show you the exact formula uh, in a moment. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you the exact formula in a moment. Um, so uh, Bach tensor is basically some contraction of vial curvature plus uh, uh, some divergence of uh, so-called cotton tensor. I, I'll show you the exact. Uh, so that's the Bach, Bach tensor. And whenever I say Bach, I mean Bach equation, I mean Bach tensor is a two tensor, Bij equals to zero. I'll, I'll show you uh, the equation. Anyway, this is my plan. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, this is my plan. Uh, before uh, we go further, any question? Okay, cool. Uh, so enough abstract and introduction. I talk about uh, what other people did. Yeah, here's a, here's the setup. Um, um, as as I said, um, uh, uh, as I said, uh, in some sense, um, in some sense, Bach equation is a generalization of uh, Einstein's equation, Einstein's field equation. Um, well, I'm not super precise. I need to be careful uh, what I mean. You can prove, um, uh, I'm going to show the proof, uh, you can prove any solutions to Einstein's field equation is also a solution to Bach equation. Another way of saying um, the space of solution, space of solution of Einstein equation is contained inside the space of solution of Bach equation. So um, in some sense, uh, uh, if, if you think about um, uh, all the solutions, solution space of Bach equation, it has more solution. So here is the lemma, the first lemma, what I stated. And uh, these are my notation. The first one, Bij, uh, so Bij, um, this is my so-called um, Bach tensor. Again, um, uh, I know some of you guys are mathematician. I do apologize. Uh, sometimes uh, I will say tensor, I mean tensor component, um, uh, with respect to some coordinate, 
if you find it like very offensive, then um, pretend that I'm using um, abstract indices like Penrose notation. So BIJ is literally a tensor, not tensor component. I mean, BIJ equals, uh, it's, a, like, um, it's a tensor product of two things. Anyway, a uh, uh, little bit of uh, technicality. So, uh, I mean, uh, if you think BIJ is, is really tensor, that's fine. Uh, then you need to translate everything um, in abstract notation, Penrose notation. Um, if you think uh, they're a uh, component, that's fine. But most of the times I also tensor instead of saying tensor component. Uh, so here BIJ uh, is, uh, is a back tensor and um, W is uh, my um, vial tensor. If you're not familiar with the vial tensor, it's a part of uh, part of your uh, full curvature tensor, Riemann uh, tensor, uh, more precise, that's the trace-free part. And the PIJ is so-called Schouten tensor. Um, uh, my advisor always says Schouten tensor. It's Schouten tensor. It's um, Schouten tensor is basically the uh, conformal geometry analog of Ricci tensor. Uh, a Schouten tensor has a uh, uh, better conformal behavior, and yeah. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to say, um, the Riemann, um, uh, the full Riemann. Uh, if you ever, if you ever do conformal transformation of uh, Riemann curvature tensor, you will see how ugly some transformation could be. On the other hand, as I said, vial is nice, it's conformal and brilliant. And at the same time, the uh, if you if you write the conformal transformation or behavior of Ricci, uh, it's, it's also nasty, but uh, Schouten has more nice conformal behavior. So in conformal geometry, um, vial and Schouten, these two are some sort of my basis curvature thing. Uh, notice if you look at the definition, um, the PIJ equals to some constant times, Ricci minus uh, some constants time GIJ. Here, this R is the uh, scalar curvature thing. So um, PIJ is some linear com combination of Ricci and your given metric G. Um, it's some sort of trace adjustment, you could say. Um, it's not precisely trace-free, a little bit of trace adjustment so that you have better kind of conformal um, behavior. And the third tensor is so-called um, cotton tensor. Uh, sometimes people say cotton or uh, York tensor. And physics people will be happy. <laughs> the last one, um, the fourth one is um, uh, Einstein tensor. Uh, in dimension four. And uh, here is my um, vacuum Einstein. Uh, now I'm showing you the proof why any solution of Einstein equation is also a solutions to Bach equations. Here is my um, uh, Einstein's um, field equation, the, the vacuum one, quote unquote. And if you take trace uh, by trace, uh, yeah, like uh, very naively speaking, you multiply inverse GIJ both sides. If you take the trace, then you have the value of your lambda cosmological constant, which is one over r. Uh, this basically tells you your uh, scalar curvature is constant. And if you plug in your r value in this first equation, you have this equation, uh, Ricci equals to one for r times gij. Uh, so this, this is my... Um, um, the second equation is my Einstein um, field equation. Uh, if you plug in your uh, lambda value. Uh, remember folks, uh, in maths, most of the times, uh, this is the way we define Einstein tensor. We, we say Rij minus one over N times Rgij, N is the dimension. Um, uh, anyways, um, also we have a better kind of definition um, uh, uh, that is more, and the motivation uh, comes from the second equation. Uh, we define a manifold to be Einstein if its Ricci curvature is just a multiple of uh, 
multiple of your uh, metric, given metric G. So this is the definition of Einstein manifold. Uh, well, um, uh, people abuse notation a lot. Whenever people say a uh, thing is Einstein, uh, they basically mean Einstein metric. Uh, and, but when people say I have Einstein manifold, that basically mean you have a manifold with Einstein metric. So Einstein metric and Einstein manifold, uh, people use interchangeably. Uh, like uh, things are clear from the context. Anyway, that's the definition, Ricci equals uh, lambda G. A little bit of remark here, Ricci equals lambda G. Um, um, you could say your little lambda could be a function on, a, on your manifold. It could be any function. Then you give a little bit of mathematical argument. Uh, what do you do? You apply so-called contracted Bianchi identity once, then it forces your little lambda to be a constant. Therefore, people say this little lambda is a constant, not a function. But you can start with a function. That is absolutely fine. Anyway, that's some little bit of technicality. Anyway, let's see. So here, um, since R um, in equation two, my uh, scalar curvature R is basically uh, four times a cosmological constant. That basically means R is uh, lambda. Uh, R, uh, R is constant. Therefore, equation two is a criterion for Einstein manifold. Uh, therefore, math, uh, like if something, uh, when, whenever uh, you have Einstein field, empty space Einstein field equation, uh, mathematicians say uh, we have uh, it, it, the solutions, the solutions to your equation uh, is Einstein metric um, by extension or manifold is Einstein. Um, So now we have Einstein um, Einstein manifold, and you define your. Uh, by the way, this is the definition of Cauchy tensor CIJ, uh, CIJK, which is basically the derivative of your uh, Schaltian tensor. You just change the order. Um, and uh, this is identically zero, and the argument is pretty simple because uh, why this is identically zero? Argument is very simple. Here, your uh, R. Rij, uh, Rij is uh, some constant multiple of Gij. Uh, your Ricci is a constant multiple of G. And if you use this definition, if you use this definition, definition of Schalten tensor, the next, after just one, one or two lines computation, you prove your Schalten is a multiple, constant multiple of your matrix. Since, Schalten is a constant multiple of metric, and uh, and your uh, and the the covariant de derivative or connection I'm taking here is uh, metric compatible. By co metric comp compatible, I mean its derivative is zero. Uh, so so Pij is just some constant time metric. Therefore, its derivative is zero. Like both part is zero, it's identical is zero. Cij is zero. Okay, good. So far, so good. Then we are almost done. Now, let's just look at the very first expression of um, very first expression of Bach tensor. The Cij thing, the first part is zero, identically zero. And I'm gonna give you a very quick argument why second part of zero. Uh, you don't need to compute the vial thing. Notice that you are uh, multiplying. Uh, your Schalten tensor, uh, the index at upper slot. So that basically means you are, uh, since your P is a multiple of G, that basically means you are taking trace. And it's a very standard fact, um, vial curvature is trace free. And that's the argument why second one is also zero. So this is the proof uh, your Bij is identically zero. So this so is the not, uh, is this a proof uh, like dimension independent? I guess so, right? Uh, a very good question, sir. This, uh, whatever I said is completely dimension uh, dimension independent. So I mean, okay, my first lemma, my six, first lemma works, yeah. first lemma works in n dimension. Uh, n is greater than or equal to three. Yeah, that is a good question. So this result holds in any in any dimension. Um, 
Okay, so that's that, that, that that's my proof. Any other question? Okay, cool. A um, little bit of uh, as, uh, extra remark slash aside. Um, if you think about, uh, by the way, whatever math people say, mathematicians say <laughs> empty space, Einstein filled equation, like 99% of the time, they're lambda and um, uh, energy, stress energy tensor both are zero. Cosmological constant and T both are identically zero. So, um, uh, in fact, uh, what fishermen merged then did, uh, their lambda was identically zero. But um, uh, but uh, some of the results does not depend, it doesn't matter whether your lambda is zero or not. For example, the lemma that I um, showed you. Uh, but uh, yeah, but there are some results. Those are not true in higher dimensional. They're true in only four dimension with lambda equals zero. Anyways, um, for example, in uh, if lambda equals zero, then uh, things become more nicer. Then again, um, if if lambda equals zero, then you can prove uh, uh, scalar curvature r is identically zero. Then your Einstein's field equation is uh, more nice. Uh, uh, in that case, uh, since r is zero, then your Ricci tensor is identically zero. Uh, uh, a little bit of a terminology. Whenever Ricci tensor is identically zero, then we and you find the corresponding met a metric uh, that corresponds to the solution of Ricci equals identically zero. That metric is called Ricci flat metric, um, and we say our manifold is Ricci flat. Uh, what I'm saying, if your manifold is Ricci flat, it automatically back flat. Uh, if your manifold is Einstein, it's automatically uh, Bach flat. By Bach flat, I mean vanishing um, uh, Bach or uh, Bach tensor identically zero. Yeah, so this is what exactly I mean whenever I say Bach equation generalizes Einstein field equation. Uh, any question? So, uh... I mean, the way I, I, I am thinking about it is that, uh, you know, in GR, we have these two different notions, you know, Ricci flat and uh, Einstein. Uh, although some people think of Ricci flat as Einstein because in that case, uh, the, cos the constant is zero. But what you're saying is that uh, these two different categories of the geometry are uh, captured by one general equation, which is the vanishing of the Bach equation. So we can uh, basically uh, treat Ricci flat positive, uh, uh, Einstein uh, geometry positive or negative ca cosmological constant, all of those different classes in one, in terms of one equation. Yeah, th th that's exactly uh, what, I, what I tried to say, yeah. And um, so basically, my general definition is um, uh, Einstein metric, and um, so Ricci, fl Ricci flatness is a special condition of Einstein Einstein metric. Yeah, like yeah. So both both notions are captured whenever I say Bach flatness. Any other question? I mean, all these three different. Uh, I mean, these are all. Well, I guess not. Um, yeah. Einstein metrics don't have to be maximally symmetric, right? But uh, the maximally symmetric solutions are Einstein metrics, such the with the positive and negative cosmological constant, right? Right. Uh, like the anti disorder space and disorder space are examples. So, um, yeah, I was just wondering if. Uh, how you think about them in terms of the Bach tensor? Anyway, oh, it's, it's really uh, a so, question. So uh, the proof of the lemma says, if I have any solutions to my uh, Einstein field equation, that that solution G automatically satisfy Bach equation. I mean, if so then basically said uh, so what I mean, all like if you collect all the solutions of your Einstein equation, that solution is basically a subset of the solutions of Bach equation. In that sense, uh, Bach flatness is a generalization of um, Einstein equation. 
or uh, Bach flatness is a generalization of Einstein matrix. Uh, the other thing I, I couldn't help but notice is that the Bach equation seemed to have one extra derivative, right? Uh, whereas we know that Einstein equation are second order yeah. uh, differential equations if I think of G as my fundamental right, uh, right. degree of freedom. So yeah, is the Bach his... equation, um, does it, the solution of the Bach equation in general, not in these, not in the case of where we have solutions to Einstein equation, uh, you know, does it, do they uh, have to satisfy the same kind of boundary condition? That is, do I have to specify the, the second order, second derivative of G? Um. E, uh, I uh, I don't know the general uh, setup. I uh, I I am for last couple of months. I only uh, studied the linearization of Bach equation. I mean, I ignored all the second derivative thing, or I tried to kill all the second derivative things. Then I. Uh, observe some beautiful result. I mean, you can uh, still have second derivatives of G and still be a linear equation. I mean- Oh, you... I'm, like I'm considering, uh, I'm considering the second derivative of G, but uh, uh, when I'm taking the linearization of things, uh, like uh, then I'm considering all the nonlinear parts. Like, yeah, I'm taking- uh, um... so, so, you know, this is something, sorry, uh, what I'm trying to say, let me just, you know, so, you know, one considers all kinds of, you know, generalizations of Einstein gravity, right? And one of the common things um, is that to consider adding Gauss Bonnet type of to Einstein gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in four dimensions, of course, the Gauss Bonnet term doesn't add anything new to the equation of motion. But if you're doing six dimensional gravity, adding the, or five dimensions, Using you know adding the Gauss Bonnet term will actually uh, add new terms to your equation, but what's nice about those terms is that the the differential equation you get is still a second order differential equation, so your the Cauchy kind of problem is unchanged. the The initial value problem that one deals with in uh, normal GR you know, in principle, that's some change. You don't have to specify G and the derivative of G. So, you know, you, you foliate space-time with some time slices and you don't have to then specify G on a hypersurface and, and, and spatial derivative of G and then the higher derivative of G. So my question was that for the B equals to zero, the general solution, it appears to me that you might have to add those other extra terms because you have a derivative of the cotton tensor in the mm -hmm. uh, in your equation. Um, um, maybe um, um... I don't understand the question precisely, sir. Uh, but I can. Uh, um, I'll. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. No uh, worries. Uh, I mean, I, I will. I will message you. Uh, yeah. The question in more detail. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can just ask a complementary question with Gabriel, sir. Sure. So, say I have a Bach equation with all the condition you have said. Is the Cauchy problem well posed for Bach equation? Um, so actually what he I asked, no, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, um, uh, I don't know. I am. Okay. Maybe I, I don't know an example. So I if don't know that. Is a, a, ADS space time is an solution of Bach equation. Uh, yes. Okay. Then the Cauchy problem is. Yes. Yeah. That, that answer is yes. Um, <laughs> The problem is not well posed. So I think, Tibrosar, you got your answer now. Yeah, thank you. That's a very clever way of doing it because of the, of the boundary of ADS, right? Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, um, sorry. Uh, sometimes I struggle to understand. Uh, okay, uh, a little bit of, anyway, uh, some um, extra remark. For example, uh, 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 like if you take, um, uh, if, if, you, if you consider the linearized version of Einstein equation around a flat metric, then your equation is um, so-called like, what is the name of the equation? Like um, uh, sum of the second derivative equals to zero of the function. Like, uh, uh, sum of the second, like uh, if, you're, if, if, if you're given a function and you take uh, all the second derivative of all, all, only, is the, what is the name? Is the Laplace? Yeah, it's the, it's, it's the Laplace equation, right? Like, uh, so for Lorentz, yeah. we need to be wave equation. Yeah, uh, yeah. So for 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 Lorentzian, it's wave equation. It, it's it's the Laplace and it, it's Laplace. Uh, yeah, Laplace n equals to zero. And so this is basically uh, your equation, uh, Einstein's field equation, in the linearized case. Uh, what happens in the Bach case? Uh, it's a double Laplacean. Is a, a Laplacean of Laplacean equals to zero. So in I mean, it's it's a fourth order thing. Yeah, but uh, the Cauchy problem. I think it's the Lyapunov's operator you're thinking about. Yeah, and 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 the Laplacian Laplacian is not like not not the. It's kind of a Laplacian, but for. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's not like the we say uh the is the usual Laplacian we call Ralph Laplacian and my Laplacian is a Lyapunov. Yeah. How do you pronounce it? Lyapunovitz. 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 He was a Polish mathematician. It's so, just uh, the uh, it just uh, or standard Laplacian plus some junk term and junk term is nice. Anyway, uh, uh, so this is one of the motivations why people are interested to study Bach flatness thing. Uh, this is my second motivation. This is uh, uh, this is mm, this is the action of my. Uh, conformal gravity, whatever, or vial action. And uh, the second equation, um, by the way, whenever I said two matrix are conformally related by a positive smooth function, omega, I mean, um, one metric G with G hat is a multiple of G. Uh, uh, okay, so you were given a metric G and you multiply your metric by a, non-vanishing positive function and you create and then you can prove a little bit of argument you can prove uh that guy that multiple is another metric in the same class if g is non-vanishing positive um if the original guy is like a Riemannian then after multiplication is still Riemannian if if the original guy is uh if original guy has like uh, indefinite signature after multiplication you have the same kind of signature uh, so whenever I say two matrix are two matrix are conformally related, I mean they are same up to some multiple, up to some positive multiple. By positive multiple, I mean a function defined as a manifold that should be non-vanishing. Uh, if you do that and uh, W hat, that's the vial curvature with respect to that's the vial curvature with respect to your new metric G hat. And this is the relationship. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, um, I mean, if you want to be a little bit pedantic, you could say conformally covariant with weight minus four. Uh, and if you forget the square, then it's conformally covariant with weight minus two. And, um, and the following is the change of, um, uh, and the following, this is the change of, um, volume element, the devolve is a volume element or, um, or volume form or whatever in n dimension. And then if you plug in this information here, um, so if, if you replace W by W hat, if you replace your G by G hat, if you do a little bit of computation, then you have uh, what you have negative four plus N, uh, I mean, omega, omega to the negative four plus N times uh, 
the norm of the Weyl curvature squared uh, times the volume, volume. And it says the action is conformal invariant if and only if my n is four. So that basically means um, uh, this conformal invariance of Weyl action happens only in four dimension, not in other dimension. This is a very, uh, and and I have no geometric understanding why this is happening in four dimension. Why four dimension is that that bizarre? Mathematically, is just obvious. Um. So that's the conformal invariance of um, Weyl action, and um. Well, that that could be uh, so that could be motivation for physicists to study Bach flatness uh, because that's the euler lagrange equation. For mathematicians, the main interest comes from uh, another thing: this the integral of Q curvature. And so Q curvature is roughly speaking uh, is the uh, is the scalar curvature analog uh, in higher demand uh, is the scalar curvature analog in um, Conformal geometry, or um, it's basically it's pretty much like a, a, I should, yeah, I mean, uh, or like two dimensional Gauss curvature analog. So this is so called Q curvature, and what happens uh, if you take the vol total vo if, if you take the volume integral, uh, if you take the volume integral of Q curvature, and you find the corresponding euler lagrange equation that is our Bach equation. So uh, as a mathematician, um, so that is my preference. The Q curvature is a very exciting thing. Um, uh, I'm gonna define in a moment what is Q curvature. Um, um, a little bit of remark. Um, uh, I mean, before, before I give you the exact definition of Q curvature, let me tell you a little bit of, um, Q curvature. Uh, Q curvature sometimes can tell you very strong information about your manifold, very strong. Um, for example, uh, 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 sorry, imagine... Milan, uh, sorry for interrupting. I have to leave, but you know, uh, I will catch up with the recording uh, and on your is recording it. Okay, thank you. See you, sir. Um, uh, okay, so um, think about a Riemannian manifold. Um, think about a Riemannian manifold, and uh, think about a Riemannian manifold. And let's say your manifold is um, okay. So uh, 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 let's say you, you have a Riemannian manifold. And it's conformally flat. Uh, um, whenever I say uh, conformally flat, uh, I, I, all the physics people know definition of the flat thing. Whenever you guys say flat, that means uh, the total full curvature is identically zero. The Riemann curvature is identically zero. Whenever I say conformally flat, I mean, let's say you have a metric G, the given metric, uh, the um, uh, the background metric, whatever, then uh, you change your metric by multiplying a positive function. Then you have a new metric, let's say G hat. And with respect to G hat, you compute, you compute Riemann curvature one more time. If it happens, your Riemann curvature is identically zero, then we say our manifold is conformally flat. Uh, but here is the thing. Finding such a function, it's nearly impossible. Like you don't know which, um, like there are like uncountably many, infinitely many functions. You don't know which function you multiply, then uh, uh, the corresponding metric G hat will produce um, uh, Riemann curvature identically zero. You don't know. That, that's uh, like if you, if you try to find this, uh, People say uh, uh, um, that this scale factor is nearly impossible to find. 
Um, so there is a better way um, to deal with this sort of things um, uh, that comes from uh, tractor calculus and ambient metric construction. Uh, I'll give you a brief uh, survey of uh, tractor calculus and um, ambient metric construction from where you don't need to deal, you don't need to uh, find things randomly. There is a canonical way uh, you can um, talk, you can solve this problem. Anyways, um, what I'm saying, for, forget everything, you have a Riemannian metric, and uh, if, you have, if you have a Riemannian manifold, and that manifold is conformally flat, what happens if your Q curvature is identically zero, then the Euler, then the, um, uh, then the Euler characteristics must be identically zero. So, so um, like, think for a second, it's a very, very strong statement, super strong statement. Because whenever you say your Euler characteristics identically zero, Euler characteristics uh, uh, is a thing related to the global property of your manifold. It's not a local thing. Like, uh, on the other hand, this curve, whatever curvature is like a local thing. Uh, so uh, like this, um, this curvature, Q curvature, whatever kind of curvature, the, the vanishing of this curvature tells you uh, some uh, global nature of your uh, topological manifold. This is so cool. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if you think about it, it's like, um, it's almost like um, the classical gauss bonnet theorem is um, two dimension. Like, um, uh, can you remember from baby differential geometry, the, the classic gauss bonnet theorem, it says like, um, uh, forget the constant thing. It says, uh, you take the total integral of your Gauss curvature, which is exactly equals to um, Euler characteristics. So that basically means the, the classic, uh, um, the classic uh, gauss bonnet Theorems or formula uh, gives you some sort of local global relationship. So, um, so we have some sort of local global relationship here also. Uh, uh, that uh, relation. Sorry, I have a question. Please. So, uh, you are considering integration over Lorentzian manifold or Riemannian manifold in this Q curvature equation. So, integration of Q curvature over M. Um, this is what, 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 I'm, what I'm saying. Let's say uh, uh, this statement is true for um, Riemannian manifold. Uh, uh, this is uh, the, this statement is uh, I'm true for Riemannian manifold. Uh, this statement is false. Uh, it's a very good point. This statement is false for uh, arbitrary uh, signature. No, not good arbitrary. Point. Let's say, say Lorentzian because uh, it's false. Saying... It's false. It's false. Okay, so Lorentzian is not true. Okay, and, no, it's false. Uh, and, 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 and the argument is one line argument. Can, can you can you share the argument? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the argument is this. Uh, uh, very naively speaking, um, the statement of Gauss Bonnet theorem is four dimension. Is the generalization of uh, uh, the Gauss Bonnet? Uh, people say Chern Gauss Bonnet in four dimension. The Chern Gauss Bonnet is uh, Euler characteristics equals to integral of vial, integral of vial square plus integral of Q curvature. And it's a very standard result in conformal geometry. If your manifold is conformally flat, then then is vial is identically zero. So that is the vial thing. Then you have um, so then you have um, the, uh, um, yeah, so then you, then basically you have uh, Euler characteristics equals to uh, integral of, uh, uh, integral of Q curvature, basically, yeah. Okay, and uh, how is this Q curvature? Uh, uh, oh, uh, what is the, what is, what is the definition? Yes. Yeah, so here's the definition, yeah. Um, so here's the definition of Q curvature in four dimension. Uh, it, it has a, um, so this is the four dimensional version of Q curvature. Uh, it has a, a higher dimensional analog, uh, 
which was um, defined by Branson. Um, um, and I don't know, I, do, I don't need higher dimensional Q curvature. Yeah. yeah. So this is, it's, uh, it's, it's just uh, Laplacian plus uh, trace of Ricci plus uh, normal scalar curvature. Uh, forget those uh, numbers. So that means the Q curvature cannot be defined even in a Lorentzian setting, right? Because you are using Laplacian. Or can you use wave instead of Laplacian? Um, um, on top of my head, I don't know. I mean, is there any general way of doing it? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'll think about it. Okay. I don't know. Maybe more... Uh concrete question. I mean, why we are interested in this Q curvature? Because everything is in Riemannian setting, but in GR, why we are interested in a Riemannian thing? I mean, it's not useless, of course, but why, why is the motivation oh. to study something Riemannian? Um, okay. Um, 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 so why people are interested in Q curvature? Yes. Um, um, as I said, um, think about the functional, like you... Um, you integrate um, you integrate total Q curvature. And by, uh, notice that the Q curvature depends on some metric G, right? It is, everything is metric dependent expression. Mm -hmm. And and you want to find uh, uh, one motivation is Q curvature uh, is uh, the built in is Sean Gauss Bonnet theorem. So Sean Gauss is, is built in. Um, if, 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 I, if, I, if I show you the next slide, you will see the Q curvature is built in in four dimension, it's, it's built in. Um, this guy's, I mean, this, uh, we don't see this guy's two dimension and three dimension, um, it's not there. It's just identically zero in uh, two dimension and three dimension. Um, um, uh, so they're, they're, they're built in also, um, uh, <laughs> For conformal geometry, Q curvature has nice conformal behavior. And uh, this is the conformal behavior. Uh, the, uh, so this is, uh, if you have two different metric, uh, and this is the conformal relationship, the Q prime equals uh, Q check equals Q plus some other P. And th then the P guy, P guy is some divergence term. The P, P is some divergence term. Uh, th this is so-called Penny's operator, whatever. Uh, this, uh, this p thing, the junk term is conformal invariant. So in conformal geometry, um, finding conformal invariant is nearly impossible. Like it's very, un unless you know, you don't know any tractor calculus or something, uh, constructing conformal invariance is, is very rare. So Q curvature is like almost conformal uh, up to the junk, to the, the, uh, up to the junk. Okay, so, uh, but in this case, this GAB, is also a Riemannian metric, right? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a Riemannian thing. Conformal yeah. invariant or almost conformal invariant for Riemannian geometry, oh, right? Almost. Uh, I uh, yeah. I uh, this. Uh, but, but this is uh, this is geometry invariant. Uh, I, I mean, this result is. Uh, 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 I mean, I mean, uh, this is true for any kind of signature. But Q curvature cannot be defined, at least uh, I haven't seen uh, from this talk defined even for Lorentzian setting, but how then it can be invariant under any signature? Oh, no, I'm, I'm saying, uh, 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 I mean, you can, you can define uh, Q curvature. Uh, uh, the problem will be whenever you take, take the integration, th th then, you're, then there will be some trouble. But you can define Q curvature regardless of your signature. Okay, so then Q curvature is defined in a Lorentzian setting, and then... yeah, I mean you can you can define Q curvature any time, but the problem will be whenever you take the inter integral, then then you need to be careful, uh, Maybe because some... uh, and yeah, and uh, some of the results are not uh, true. Uh, some of the results are true only for uh, Riemannian signature, and uh, I mean say in the context of Einstein GR, how this Q curvature helps or what's the significance of Q curvature? Like conformal Einstein GR, not full Einstein GR. 
Uh, and you have Laurentian signature. Yeah, so say uh, we done all I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, for uh, if you if you if your signature is Laurentian, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. It just uh, it's interesting from <laughs> mathematician's point of view. Yeah, I don't know. Lorentzian geometry is not a non-mathematician point of view, of course. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Okay, so yeah, please go on. I shouldn't say that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, anyways, uh, so this is uh, uh, this equation is uh, sorry. I um, I don't have a very good answer. Um, so this is uh, this is this uh, statement of uh, Gauss Bonnet theorem and uh, uh, Gauss Bonnet theorem in um, four dimension. And yeah, so th think about think about this as uh, a side thing. Uh, th this is this is uh, this is why I said. Some of the facts, some of the facts are not true whenever uh, 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 whenever um, your signature is not positive. For example, this is this is another nice fact. Um, if you have a um, four-dimensional manifold with Riemannian signature, that guy's flat um, 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 no, my, uh, I need to change my, yeah, it's, uh, I should say, yeah, this is statement is false. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the statement, if you have an Einstein manifold, the four, uh, if you have Einstein manifold in four dimension, uh, if you Einstein manifold in four dimension with a positive signature, then manifold is flat if and only if Euler characteristics is zero. So this is not true in uh, other signature. This is not true. Um, so, uh, and this comes from here and you take the integral. Uh, and what happens? Um, uh, uh, what happens, uh, you can prove uh, this R, is, uh, the norm of R square and norm of uh, four times Ricci square, they're exactly the same for Einstein manifold in four dimension. Then, uh, then technically you have just uh, the norm of uh, Riemann square. And uh, since you have a positive signature, uh, uh, this guy is non-negative, uh, therefore the result holds. Uh, and you, you can see this argument, this is not true for arbitrary signature. So only one, yeah, I would say um, uh, other than you don't do integration, then your signature is anything. Whenever you take integration, be careful if you want to conclude something. Uh, like, like, can you, can you guys follow this argument? What I said, whenever you have a Riemannian manifold, uh, uh, which is Einstein, and that guy is flat if and only if Euler characteristics zero. So, and it comes from this uh, this version of um, uh, Charles Gauss Bonnet formula. Again, I I, I, mean, I mean whenever I'm taking in integral, uh, all the time my manifold is oriented. Otherwise, integral uh, doesn't make any sense. Okay, so another motivation, um, another motivation why people are interested to study uh, Bach equation. Uh, uh, I said uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation corresponds to um, Weyl action is basically Bach equations. Euler-Lagrange equation corresponds to integral of Q curvature. There's also Bach equation. Bach equation. Uh, with uh, uh, to reduce all those ambiguity, uh, let's say whenever I'm talking about um, Q curvature thing, my manifold is Riemannian. Uh, in that case, uh, you cannot apply GR there, but that's fine. And my 
Yeah, so this is my third motivation. And there, there are some other uh, motivation. Third motivation is this one. So this is the classic uh, uh, Maxwell, uh, Maxwell action, whatever. This is, uh, you, you, you just take the norm of your um, Faraday two tensor. Uh, I, I, people, what do you guys call F? It's like elect some kind of strength in physics literature. Electromagnetic strength. So again, uh, is, okay. are you considering now Riemannian manifold or Lorentzian manifold, this M in this equation SF? Uh, here, uh, here it could be. Uh, here it could be. Uh, okay, so um, uh, the okay, so the best the like to do what kind of maths I want to do? Just you need this one three dimensional. I mean, your three dimensional slice with um, Riemannian signature and one um, time direction. So it, it could be. Uh, uh it could have like uh uh one three signature but uh your manifold should be given this sort of structure like time slice and so basically then it works the hyperbolic manifold is sufficient for you yeah yeah then then, then this setup works right okay. like strictly Riemannian uh strictly uh Riemannian curvature is not required here Anyway, um, so this part, I guess you guys um, know much better than I do. So this is completely physics. Uh, I choose this example only for you guys so that they, at least um, you know that Bakken's is useful. So this is um, so-called um, um, fair action or Maxwell action, whatever. And if you find the corresponding Euler Lagrange equations, that is my that is our um, uh, Max, uh, Maxwell equations. Uh, and uh, uh, it depends whether you want like a free Maxwell equation by by free I mean source free, uh, or like the general version. It, in that case, you need to do a little bit of modification here. Like you, you need to do a little bit of modification but mathematics don't change much. Uh, so let's say I'm talking about free Maxwell equation. Uh, then uh, it was well known, uh, and, and the argument is very simple. You can prove uh, this action is conformal invariant only in four dimension. The proof is exactly similar to that one. The, the proof is exactly similar to this one. So that guy is conformal invariant, uh, conformal invariant in uh, four dimension, and uh, by extension, by extension, your uh, Faraday tensor or Faraday two tensor or electromagnetic field of strength. That guy is conformal. Those guys are conformally uh, invariant. Your uh, uh, Maxwell equation is conformal invariant. Uh, I, I think, um, uh, yeah, um, I mean, based on my knowledge, I think this is the very uh, oldest motivation uh, for studying conformal geometry. I mean, physics people knew this result for a long time. Uh, then, uh, then people try to construct some other conformally invariant uh, things. Then, uh, and if you try to do that, then like the very, um, like very good looking tensor, and like, uh, like for physics people, like every day, like the tensor you use pretty much every day, those are not conformal invariant. Anyways, uh, and um, the, uh, and also it's a well known uh, conform. Uh, there's uh. This Maxwell theory is gauge invariant, and uh, the gauge symmetry group is circle group, uh, and circle group is super uh, trivial. Uh, S one, uh, it's uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> it has all the nice property of Lie group is like a baby Lie group, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's abelian. Um, so 
let's try to generalize this thing, uh, this kind of theory to a non-abelian setting, non-abelian gaze setting. Your symmetry group is non-abelian. And you guys know the motivation, the physics part behind um, um, uh, what kind of things you are trying to uh, connect, I don't know. Um, and then you change your uh, symmetric group and your group is a little bit complicated one, SU3 times SU2 times your circle group. And you, mod and you do some sort of modification in your um, um, field strength and your definition of field strength is a little bit it's more like uh, it's more like Faraday tensor. Re remember, the F uh, the previously F was like uh, exterior derivative of A. Here A is some one form. So here it's uh, it's basically one exterior derivative of one form plus some other junk term. Uh, And also notice that you change the definition of norm. Uh, I, I like uh, I, I choose like double vertical line. So this is not um, this is not tensor norm anymore. This is some weird kind of norm. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. In Lie algebra, in Lie theory, people uh, people call this a Cartan norm, whatever. And. You also change your definition of exterior derivative a little bit. Uh, it's just uh, your classic exterior derivative plus another uh, junk term. If you, if you do that and your corresponding Euler equations are this, uh, which is uh, so-called uh, Young-Mills equations. Uh, those are a little bit of like next best generalization of um, generalizations of Maxwell equation. Uh, and we have some computation. I'm going to skip those computation. What happens? Um, well, uh, so there's two, uh, what I'm saying are exactly the same thing. Uh, uh, like two guy, uh, uh, one was a mathematician and the second one is a mathematician. The first one is a physicist. Uh, they both independently found that um, the associated Young-Mills equations with respect to your uh, this uh, new kind of uh, derivative or like Cartan connection, whatever, in four dimension is very closely connected to your Bach flatness. So, yeah. So this is uh uh. uh, uh uh, my, uh, I, I mean, uh, this, this part of us, like uh, Rod Garber, uh, one guy's Rod Garber, I forgot the other guy, uh, they did sort of the things. So this uh, um, uh, Young Mills, um, uh, the Young Mills equation in four dimension um, with respect to uh, this, uh, by, by the way, uh, this, uh, um, uh, so this uh, new kind of, uh, uh, derivative or uh, connection, whatever, this is conformal invariant. With respect to this conformal invariant connection, uh, Young-Mills equations reduced to Bach flatness. Okay, so uh, uh, my, uh, okay, so that, that, that's the, that's, that was from Fizz's point of view. Uh, I am personally interested to understand the solution of Bach equations uh, because of uh, its connection to Pfefferman Graham's ambient metric construction. Uh, uh, I'll give you a brief idea of what is this construction. Uh, the philosophy was, uh, you want to study n-manifold and um, particularly, um, yeah, uh, you, you want to study n manifold. So sometimes what happens, uh, I mean, you can you can see things better like if you go a little bit higher. I'm sorry, I'm I'm being vague. Uh, it's uh, it's not precisely mathematical. It's a little bit of philosoph philosophical. For example, like uh, like all the notion of uh, uh, like uh, homology, cohomology, whatever, or like sheaf. 
uh, whatever, like bundle, like uh, this sort of construction has like, uh, like a common philosophy. Uh, you, you have some sort of um, ground, like base manifold and you, uh, you assign like on every point, you assign some other uh, structure, then you have some sort of bigger manifold. Uh, like, I mean, it's not a manifold all the time. Like you find a much bigger structure then, um, and you do some kind of mathematics on the bigger structure, then you conclude something about your base manifold. So this is basically the general philosophy of, of construction sheaf. Um, or, uh, 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 and I, I don't know, if physics people, you, you might be comfortable with the bundle. So this is the philosophy of bundle. Uh, so what, uh, I mean, Pfeffer and Graham, uh, Graham they, they had similar sort of philosophy. Um, uh, so their, their main goal was to understand uh, some kind of conformal manifold uh, and dimensional. Uh, by the way, this time signature could be anything. Uh, it doesn't matter, Riemannian or not. They try to understand um, n-dimensional uh, conformal manifold. Uh, by the way, whenever I say conformal manifold, I mean uh, on a conformal manifold, uh, you like instead of having a single metric, you have a class of metric. There are like uncountably many metrics, and two metrics are connected uh, if one guy is a positive multiple of other. Um, so, so the issue is uh, you don't have a fixed metric. There are like thousands of trillions of metrics. Since there are a lot of metrics and uh, like, uh, uh, like most of the things we know in physics, like those are like metric dependent, it comes from a fixed metric. Um, so uh, this, and this is a problem in conformal, uh, conformal manifold. Uh, you don't have a very precise notion of um, curvature. Like, how can you define the Riemannian curvature? And well, you could say, well, I can choose a representative uh, from my conformal class, then I can define my curvature with respect to that conformal that metric. And someone will ask, well, I, if I, what happens if I choose another metric and I can define my curvature? Then if you're uh, and then if you choose another representative and you can define curvature one more time and then like do have the same kind of thing. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm being vague. Uh, the, the main problem is, uh, the main problem is in, uh, in a conformal manifold, uh, the usual notion of curvature, usual notion of invariance, usual notion of tensors are not well-defined. It's super, super ill-defined. Um, uh, because, because you don't have a fixed metric. And uh, people try to uh, uh, resolve this problem in many ways. Uh, these days, uh, there are like um, two different, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, they are basically same, uh, but yeah, uh, but they're basically the same. So one is um, you resolve this problem using um, tractor calculus. Uh, also, you resolve you can resolve this problem a little bit formally uh, using ambient metric construction. So what is the ambient metric construction? So you you have a base manifold n dimension. Then every point you just array you just um, uh, every every point of the manifold, you uh, assign some one-dimensional ray. Uh, like you, you can think about you are creating some sort of cone. Uh, some sometimes people call cone bundle or ray bundle, whatever. Uh, or people say metric bundle, uh, and uh, there is a particular reason why people say metric bundle. Uh, then you have a metric bundle. So it's uh, that guy's one more higher dimensional thing. Thing then you flatten, then you flatten your key, uh, then you flatten your cone. It's like uh, you um, you introduce another parameter. This is like so-called transverse parameter. So then you, uh, I don't know. Um, so what what eventually happened from some n-dimensional thing? You create um, n plus two-dimensional things. And and you do all your calculus on that n plus two dimensional thing. 
or or or, or, or like like you do your, your geometry on n plus two dimensional things and geometry become much easier than you um uh, um then you conclude something about your base manifold uh, so this is the idea uh, i don't know i'm sorry i'm being vague like do you guys understand the main idea of philosophy i have a question actually uh can you hear me please oh um, so this expression by two extra dimensions um what time signature do they have do they have like minus time signature these extra two directions um um yeah so uh they are um is it uh time uh the one is like one one you can think about the first one is uh uh one minus the time one minus uh like you can think that the time uh, one is like minus and the other one is not the other one oh, is uh yeah other one is not because I remember there's some isomorphism between the conformal group in dimension D and some bigger group of isometry, non-conformal isometry in dimension D plus two. Uh, yeah. So, so this right. is the, this is yeah. So this is what comes from conf uh, uh, this ambient metric construction. Yeah. Ah, I mean, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, it was purely mathematical, but uh, these days, I mean, recently I I attended talk. Physicists are very, very interested in ambient metric construction. Mm. Um, sorry, I'm not very precise and organized. So, so this is the thing. Um, uh, so here, here's a, a Lorenzian. Um, so my uh, initial uh, metric, um, my, uh, I don't know. So it's, you can see there is a crazy metric like G, uh, I, J, this uh, capital I and J, their interval. Uh, uh, and this little I, J, this little I, J is a metric. Uh, this little I, J is a metric. Uh, little I, J is a one parameter uh, family of metric, uh, Riemannian metric on your space. That's why I said like the second parameter uh, is not in like negative direction, roughly speaking. With time, and I introduce another guy, time, that is the negative direction. And overall, you have a, a Lorentzian metric. So this is my Lorentzian metric. Uh, that is in uh, n plus two dimension. But by the way, do, do you guys understand this? Met like, uh, can, you, can you see this met metric? Yes. It's an n plus two dimension. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, like, uh, yeah, so row, uh, my, uh, uh, so for every row, for every row, I have a positive metric with Riemannian signature. So like the negative things only comes from T. Um, so this is my metric. <laughs> and, and then, and you do like, like nastiest, like the most nasty possible computation one can imagine. Like you compute the Ricci scalar uh, with respect to the, this matrix, and you have this uh, Ricci scalar. Uh, this is this is your Ricci curvature uh, with respect to this matrix in n plus two dimension. And uh, um, Pfefferman, uh, you guys know he's a field medalist, uh, uh, and they said this is a straightforward but tedious calculation. They said, and uh, in my view, uh, well, it could be tedious, but this is one of the most remarkable computations in geometry in last. 30 or 40 years. I mean, it solved um, like at least five or six different unsolved problems. Anyway, so, so this is my uh, metric G. And here you have like. Um, uh, uh, sorry, what is G prime and G double prime? Uh, which one? Yeah, in equation four. Um, on two, three, and three, three, and three, two, you have G prime. Oh, oh, oh and yeah, G good double question. Prime. So, uh, I am sorry. So, what every prime is like row derivative. I'm taking derivative with respect ah, okay, to okay. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. like the GIJ is a one parameter family of metric, Riemannian metric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, this is my um, uh, this is my expression for Ricci curvature, and this uh, R with uh, 
index little ij, this is that crazy expression. Uh, well, again, I'm saying it's like, uh, it's not a, uh, if you know, if you're comfortable with uh, like uh, Ricci calculus, tensor calculus, like anyone can do this, but it just takes a week or something to do this computation, but it's not like- But like we can do these things in uh, computer, right? Yeah, you, you can. Yeah, like you, you don't need to be brilliant. You, you don't need to be brilliant. You can do this. Yeah. Uh, if you guys know how to, I, 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 I don't know how to use computer. If, if you can help me, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, sometimes I need to do a lot of crazy calculation. So, I mean, if you Someone use Mathematica, there's a Mathematica package that does this uh, Riemann, Riemannian geometric computations. Oh, cool. I never tried. Yeah, maybe, yeah. It, it, Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, 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 I'll talk to you guys uh, how to use technology to do this sort of computations. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I mean, last month, I mean, uh, not last month, um, a month, like two months before, I, I, I did like some stupid calculations. It took almost a month. Maybe if I had some technology, it could be done like 10 minutes. Anyways, so this I mean, is uh, get extremely complicated. Yeah, so this is um this is my uh, Ricci tensor, and let's say you put some restriction. This guy is Ricci flat metric. Let's say this guy is Ricci flat, uh, and one necessary condition is if that guy that guy's Ricci flat, then uh, clearly the um then this guy um uh, like all oh, like if if this our guy's Ricci flat, all the component has to be zero. And particularly think about this little r, uh, little thing, this little thing, rij thing, that guy has to be zero. And if you, if you do a little bit of computation, no math, like no fancy maths computation at rho equals zero, then you have this beautiful equation, which is the derivative of um, the rho derivative of your metric equals to this expression. And whenever you see this sort of expression, conformal geometry, people are, oh God, this is beautiful because this guy is your um, Schouten tensor. Schouten tensor is one of the uh, one of the basic elements in conformal geometry because it has nice uh, conformal behavior. So, uh, so what I'm saying uh, in this ambient metric construction, uh, there are uh, some hidden conformal geometry. Uh, I mean. Uh, because like all of a sudden, like you have this um, Schouten metric, uh, Schouten tensor. Um, anyways, uh, uh, and I said a couple of times, the Schouten tensor has better conformal behavior. Yeah, this is what I exactly mean. This is uh, this, um, Schouten, uh, sorry for my weird writing. Uh, um, the Schouten with respect to new metric equals to old Schouten plus some other junk. And uh, um, if you guys are familiar with twister geometry, this is a very common term introduced by twister, uh, introduced by uh, Roger Penrose. It's very common. And his notation, uh, I'm directly copying his notation. He says, uh, this guy's uh, uh, upsilon. Upsilon is the log derivative, log covariant derivative of your function. Uh, sorry, is this expression related to uh, Penrose operator? Ah, uh, I, I mean, uh, this uh, this epsilon. Uh, this is uh, this is the Penrose notation. Like uh, this epsilon, this log log derivative. Uh, I don't know what is Penrose operator. Oh, ah, okay. So, so if you, yeah. yeah, if you take a spin manifold, then Penrose operator arises some of nature, somehow oh. naturally. But maybe it's not the same. Okay. Yeah. So this is not the Penrose operator. I don't know. So this is uh uh, the, I, I mean, uh, mm, uh, uh, sorry, extra remark or uh, aside. So this this uh, epsilon i, uh, it comes from a function, uh, and it has all those index raising and lowering business like tensor. And um, uh, before, uh, uh, like before this Penrose notation, I mean, uh, th this sort of equation um, looked very crazy. If you if, if you look for like uh, Wikipedia, uh, if you look like a transform, uh, conformal transformation of Riemann curvature, and if you see the expression, that's nasty. Then, um, 
uh, and Perry's notation is nice in this in, in this case. Anyway, okay, sir, so I have uh, one question. So, so from the expressions that you wrote down, I mean, the same kind of similars. I was wondering, uh, uh, um, there's a tensor called a vial tensor, which has some similarities with the Riemann tensor and encodes some mm -hmm. information about the curvature while being conformal invariant. Um, 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 uh, is there some relation between this vial tensor and the Riemann tensor of this ambient metric space? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, uh, there, there, oh, okay. there are some beautiful relationship. Yeah, I'm going to say that. Okay, uh, okay yeah. great. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, what, what, what you said is correct. Uh, 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 a manifold uh, is conf conformally invariant, I mean, locally, not globally, not necessarily. Uh, um, a manifold is locally conformally invariant if and only if its vial curvature is identically zero. So this is, right. yeah, that's, that, that is a pretty good question. But, but, um, a vial curve which is identically zero, but like this is uh, this is the theorem by Weil and uh, Schouten. It's a very old result. It's like more than like seventy five years old. Um, uh, it's a uh, uh, I, I don't know maybe hundred years. It's a, it's a, it's a very old, uh, the way uh, like if if you if you see the proof the way they proved uh, I don't know they're famous mathematician. Uh, yeah, I've never actually uh, seen the proof. Uh, uh, okay, so but, uh, the proof is weird. Uh, that, uh, are, are you guys familiar with uh, so-called, uh, uh, what is the thing in PD people call whenever you introduce a new variable every time, like augment, what, what do you call? Like you, 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 ha you have a crazy, uh, you have a cra crazy high order PDE and from there you construct a system of PDE, introduce a new variable, what do you call? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know any math. Okay, okay, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this is a standard uh, like a trick in PDE. So they just did this kind of trick, which like standard graduate college graduate standard graduate PDE kind of thing, and it's a very nasty like uh, two or uh, three page proof. But th this proof is like um, like a half page or like uh, a half or half page if you do conformal geometry. Mm. So what I'm saying, um, finding conformal invariance from classics, uh, from, uh, uh, from classic perspective is nearly impossible. As, as I said earlier, uh, uh, if you want to use the definition, you, you want to find the functions so that your Riemann curvature is zero, finding that function is almost impossible. I mean, but now you will see some beautiful results. You don't need to talk about, uh, you don't need to talk about, uh, you don't need to find the functions. Uh, uh, any, anyway, sorry, I, I'm gonna stop. Yeah, like, yeah, sorry, I, I'll, I'll control myself. So here's the theorem. <laughs> okay. I'll control myself. So, so this is my metric, the Lorentzian metric in higher dimension, n plus two dimension. The thing is, if that guy's Ricci flat, then uh, the expression of gij, so this is my one parameter family of metric, uh, uh, is Taylor expansion with respect to rho is this one, up to, uh, up, to, uh, up to first order expression is that one. And uh, uh, all of a sudden you have a, uh, um, I mean like, yeah, so uh, we have a scouting tensor that that's that's a happy moment. If you see sc scouting tensor, and you you might guess, well, maybe I can talk about some conformal geometry thing, and it this is really there. By the way, uh, this construction, the way uh, this construction is conformal invariant. Uh, the Pfefferman gram construction was conformal invariant. It's like it doesn't matter which. It's a metric independent construction. Uh, here is a thing. If a Lorenzian metric is flat, uh, uh, I'm sorry. If you if if gij if gij is conformally flat, gij is the is the metric on the base manifold, then the Lorenzian metric is conformally flat. The top the the metric on the top metric at uh, metric on the n plus two dimension n plus two dimension is uh, flat. So uh, and also, uh, I mean, um, I, I mean, I mean, this uh, this is basically uh, this is basically um, uh, 
Yeah, so th this is uh, th this is basically telling the information about conformal geometry at the bottom reduced to uh, 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 information of flat geometry uh, at the top. This is this is cool because uh, uh, I, a little bit of notation whenever I say gijx. So, so gijx is the metric whenever my rho is identically zero. So, and uh, rho is identically zero. More precisely, this is the metric on the boundary of the cone. Um, yeah, so this this theorem is... Sorry, can, can I have a question? Uh, sure. So if I have understood it, like the bigger picture is that one can talk about the say base manifold without mm -hmm. studying it at all rather just consider m n plus two dimensional manifold and then due to this great general construction everything boils down to somehow m n right so we should just we can just think about the higher dimensional manifold and then the lower dimensional manifold result comes automatically is that true like, right so right right like i mean not exactly the not, not exactly the parallel way for example, like at, like in the n plus two like n plus two dimension, you have for example, if if n plus two dimension you have something flat. In for like if in the n plus two dimension, if you have a flat geometry that's reduced to conformally flat geometry, but I mean conformal flat and flatness are very closely connected. But by, by by closely connected, I mean whenever you say something is flat, I mean with respect to given metric, your Riemann curvature is identically zero. So conformal flat is with up to some positive function, uh, your metric give uh, identical zero Riemann curvature, right? So you're at the, at the at the top level, you have flat structure that is reduced to conformally flat structure. I see, and then is that like uh, so? Is basically then. This is true only for conformally invariant quantities, right? Yeah. So this is this is this is yeah. This is one of the yeah. This is one result, and and you have some sort of other other kind of result. Yeah. So yeah, is the base guys conformally invariant, uh, mm -hmm. conformally flat? Then that um then the top guy is flat. So conformally, this is like try to <laughs> so try to appreciate this formula. So. Reducing conformally flat thing into a flat thing is like a dream result for any mathematician. Yeah, sure. I mean, th these are very different things. So how they are related, I mean, that's what uh, I'm also wondering. Like you can just consider flatness in two dimensional higher and then it seems you can talk about conformal flatness. Uh, conformal flatness at the top uh, corresponds to the flatness at the bottom. Right, so it's, it's really, really remarkable, so. Yeah, some people say it's a remarkable calculation. I don't know, some people say remarkable. I mean, uh, in the literature, the term is popular, like remarkable calculations. <laughs> okay, yeah, please uh, go on. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, the next question, uh, that one is also like way more cool. The, 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 this is their third result. This is like way more cool. That says, your if your base if your base manifold is Einstein if your base manifold is Einstein then your top manifold then plus uh, the top manifold that guy's Ricci flat uh, I mean I mean I mean um, um, uh, and, and, and to be a little bit careful uh, so what I'm saying is that is a base manifold um, Yeah, if the base manifold is Einstein, yeah. So if the base manifold is Einstein, if the base manifold is Einstein, and uh, in that case, your top manifold is Ricci flat. And uh, I, th I think Ricci flat things are like uh, important for physics people. And in that case, um, um, uh, uh, like um, this um, uh, Taylor expansion uh, just ends at second order. And the, the first order uh, and the the first order term is Shouten, and the second one is sort of like norm of Shouten. Uh, I think um, as far as I can um, I have like I don't know the proof still now, 
Uh, and the second, uh, third theorem is also true in the other uh, in the other direction. It's sort of if and only if, if uh, uh, if the top top level you have Ricci flatness, then you have at the bottom level you have Einstein metric. So the Einstein geometry and Ricci flatness are like corresponds to each other. Um, uh, I attended a talk by Mike Stewart. Mike Stewart. Uh, uh, yeah, he did not show the proof. He said, like, this is, uh, this is also true in other way. Um, so, yeah, like, uh, like, don't believe me completely. Uh, yeah, I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll think more. Uh, if, uh, if it is true in other way, that would be, like, more exciting. And here comes the dream results that motivates mathematicians to study uh, uh, ambient metric construction. So here, here, is, uh, here is our uh, n plus two dimensional Lorentzian metric. That guy's Ricci flat. Then if that guy's Ricci flat and you try to write your metric, uh, family of metric uh, as a Taylor expansion of rho, then this is your Taylor expansion. And in the second order term, there is a thing which is so-called bar tensor. And um, um, in like most of the, like in general, so this is bar tensor is four dimension. So most, I mean, in general, the term, the coefficient here is uh, like, you cannot solve this coefficient. You cannot find this coefficient. So the general term, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, this coefficient or two tensor or whatever, uh, in general, you cannot uh, solve this thing to get this, to find this beautiful Taylor ex expansion. And that's why people call it like um, ambient obstruction tensor. And very recently, I guess in 2018, um, uh, 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 one Japanese mathematician, uh, Kango Hirachi, he proved some beautiful result about this, uh, the generalization of BIJ, which is OIJ obstruction tensor. So this is sort of very naive expression of obstruction tensor. They prove this OIJ higher dimensional analog bar tensor is uh, trace free and that guy's divergence free, it's conformally covariant and, uh, and in four dimension, it matches with bar tensor. Honestly speaking, this uh, this fourth theorem uh, that was uh, one of the key motivations. Uh, that's that's why I am interested in uh, like Bach equations, like Bach flatness. Um, uh, Bach flatness comes from uh, uh, this obstruction flatness uh, in four dimension. Okay, uh, so I'm going to skip, uh, uh, I guess uh, I have just 10 minutes, so I'm going to skip a lot of proofs. Uh, I'm not going to like do any more. Uh, um, so then, uh, well, uh, uh, I said uh, the Bach tensor has nice properties, four dimension. It is divergence free in four dimension. Uh, in physics literature, whenever something is divergence free, you guys say, well, maybe that uh, this quantity can be represented uh, to express something which is preserved, like, um, um, or maybe some sort of symmetry may be captured. Um, uh, this result, uh, this result was known by Pfefferman and Graham uh, in their this in their famous paper. Uh, 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 yeah, at some point, uh, this they wrote this guy's divergence free without any proof. Uh, uh, and and people believe them, and people uh, frequently use this result. Uh, like no one did did this. Uh, I did, and yeah. Uh, uh, it was nasty, but but it's okay. Uh, so to, to prove this result, you need to um, recall some baby Riemannian geometry. Um, uh, like whatever I'm doing right now, uh, signature doesn't matter. Um, uh, so this is the formula for a uh, divergence of uh, Riemann. Uh, um, 
I, I, I don't know, like this is like a very standard thing. Uh, it comes from like second Bianchi identity and the second one is divergence of Ricci. Uh, the divergence of Ricci is uh, the gradient of scalar curvature, which is like, like twice contracted Bianchi identity. I think physics people will love it. Um, Um, yeah, so basically, a uh, little bit of extra remark, uh, that, um, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this, this, um, this twice contracted Bianchi identity, uh, if you apply this thing with Einstein field equation, then you automatically get a G is divergence free, Einstein metric is divergence free. And I guess uh, physics people knew uh, that energy, stress energy tensor is divergence free both guys divergence free oh well maybe they're equal if not equal add some <laughs> term that that's basically the classic approach the way einstein derived his equation so it's um like uh, uh geometry people knew this uh, bianca identity uh physics people knew the divergence freeness of uh stress free uh divergence free of stress energy tensor well and einstein was brilliant he said okay there's two guys that are divergence free maybe they're equal if not equal add some term Uh, by the way, like, uh, what are some cool ways physics people derive Einstein's field equations? So there is no derivation of field equation, you know. It's a fundamental equation. But you mean the motivation? I mean, but, yeah, I mean, I mean, by derive, I mean, like, you have, I'm like, I'm not asking, like, proof. Like, I'm, I'm saying, like, how you, like, derive, like, from, for example, if you take the, uh, if you take the, if you take the, uh, Hilbert Einstein's action, then like uh, if you take the Hilbert Einstein action, you do variation on principle, like you do like a stupid 10 phase calculation. I did this calculation and you get Einstein's field equation, which is exactly the Euler-Lagrange equation. Uh, uh, one funny remark from uh, uh, Leonard Suskin. Leonard Suskin said, uh, I tried at least 100 times to derive this equation from Hilbert Einstein's action every time I gave up. Now, every time I gave up. I mean, this calculation is nasty. So I'm asking, is there any beautiful way you guys can derive this equation? Not the proof. I mean, for instance, using Einstein Hilbert action, you can, I, I don't know why it's so lengthy, because in Wall's book, it's not that lengthy. You can just use more global differential geometry point of view and then it's not uh, i mean okay 10 page also depends how one writes but uh, i mean at least i i did once when i was doing gr course uh, i didn't find it that lengthy but maybe uh, a bit less than 10 page and also you can look at uh, say from physics point of view as you have told there's actually the say historically motivated part was that or this this gedunking experiment that what really historically motivated einstein to think about what is so einstein was thinking what is gravity and then he has this philosophical idea from the understanding like uh, how we feel mass and then what should be actually responsible for mass and that you leads to the stress energy tensor, what was known from Maxwell theory, and then he generalized further. And of course, differential geometry was not developed in a local global form at that time. So he used what existing back then, local differential geometry, but he also looked at covariance, covariance with respect to coordinate transform. So everything was fine, apart from the bundle picture for what was not developed then. But uh, Basically, the idea is same. So you want to understand what is gravity, and then you ask this question, what gravitates? And anything has a mass, then it affects gravity. And then how they are related, and then you see that, okay, what is mass is basically kind of content of stress energy tensor or kind of the generalization. And then why it is just, so you can think about cause and action, and then uh, this usual or say, I, I, was, I, I found it really brilliant like gravity which what basically gives you your intrinsic curvature of your manifold and einstein tensor captured this in in some sense not directly and then what is responsible for this change of your curvature in a manifold what, what causes the manifold so there need be i mean einstein was more philosophy motivated 
coming from school of Kant and all these philosophers. So he was asked question, okay, what, what is the reason? And the reason turns out that, so if you look at Newtonian gravity, then you can see, okay, you have mass one side and the Newtonian gravity, gravitational force on the other side. And you try to generalize this picture. Now mass doesn't always make sense and force action at a distance doesn't make sense. So you want something covariant. And then you look at what's the generalization and also look at generation the other side. And that's what gives you, in one side you give the stress energy tensor because that gives you the content. So what is the content you get from a matter field or anything has an energy? And then the idea is that anything has an energy is affected by gravity. And they are coupled by the Einstein equation. So, you know, cool. it's Maybe it's basically I like same way the Dirac, Dirac, Dirac's equation. So you were looking something very concrete physically and Einstein was trying to understand what is gravity. That, that's uh, nothing else. And of course, this Bianca identity and all these things, that systematically development of Lorentzian geometry was highly motivated by the great equation and great success of the theory. And then people wrote global differential geometry and then global Lorentzian geometry and then more polished form. But uh, at least that's what I knew from my history knowledge. Thanks. Uh, no, the experimental derivation is, I mean, the one that I described, that is the correct derivation of uh, Weinstein's equations. Because the Hilbert, the Hilbert action was back engineered. I mean, it was made up so that the variation of the equation gives you Einstein's equation. Yeah, that's, that's and there's no content in, uh, I, I, and there's no content in Hilbert action that's not already present in Einstein. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. It was this perihelinous uh, result of Mercury, and Einstein was trying to match something with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, I, the my way of understanding is like uh, very uh, technical. Like, yeah, I have some action, and you do some computation, you have this equation. I don't have much physics motivation. Yeah, I need to not learn some physics. That's why I'm connected with you guys. Yeah, I, think, I mean, wow. that's how actually, because Einstein don't have that tools yeah. that we are using now. So uh, in, in fact, Lorentzian geometry was not developed. If you trace back to history, I think Einstein was one of the earliest people who really developed Lorentzian geometry. It was not even developed. So if you look at Einstein's original paper, he has this thing like from Riemannian, we know that this is symmetric and positive definite for, but we need to relax something. So you, you can find this sort of word in his paper. Okay, thanks. I'll take a look. Um, I think I don't have time. Like, like yeah, maybe uh, if, uh, because if you give me like five minutes or something, yeah. then I can maybe quickly summarize our summarize our and then uh, lift rest for your next talk. Yeah, please. Uh, like uh, uh, like do do you guys want me to give me another talk? Uh, yeah, we are be happy if you are. Sure. Okay. Um. Okay. Maybe 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 at that time I can dedicatedly talk about some uh, conformal geometry. Okay. So let me today let me uh talk about some of my results very quickly. Uh, so this is a classic results. People know the divergence of um uh sh divergence of um uh, vial. Which is some multiple of uh, some multiple of uh, cotton, uh, in, uh, and this yeah like this n minus three is common, but uh, people have some other different kind of constant uh, depending depends on their choice. So whenever you prove this beautiful uh, identity, it's nice. It's just like you see like two or three lines computation. By the way, this notation is uh, uh, standard Kulkarni Nomizu product. Then uh, after proving this result, uh, that was our definition of Bach tensor, your Bach tensor become nicer. Uh, by nicer, I mean Bach tensor is uh, completely written in terms of, uh, in terms of vial curvature. So this is vial, uh, you're taking double, uh, double divergence and here you are tracing, uh, uh, contracting with respect to Schouten. Well, uh, Schouten is very closely connected to vial because these two are, um, as I said, uh, Weil and Schouten are sort of like basis curvature in conformal geometry. So uh, 
the book is completely written in terms of a violent Shaochen. Uh, also notice that um, uh, the Shaochen is uh, is a combination of a Shaochen can. Well, no, uh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. That's the, what I'm trying. What I'm thinking is not correct. So it's, it's, uh, B is completely written as um, violent Shaochen. Um, that's good uh, from conformal geometric point of view. Then I did this stupid computation. I'm going to skip all this computation, uh, computation, computation. And then after marathon computation, like two months before, I found this beautiful result, which is the divergence of um, divergence of Bach equals to n minus four times this result. Look, I have this beautiful result, and this result basically tells you. Whenever my uh, uh, my back tensor has to be divergence free in dimension four, and uh, and so this is one, and and I did this thing uh, for fun, <laughs> and I um, I derive uh, the same result from variational principle using uh, uh, I prove a lot of uh, standard result. Uh, if you have a one parameter family of metric and and you change your like you guys know this um, uh, um, traditional computation, then I computed the uh, variation for uh, uh, crystal symbol uh, that are not tensor, uh, this derivative is ten tensor. And at some point I need to use Riemann normal coordinate, otherwise uh, it was a big mess. Uh, then variation of curvature, then if, if, if you contract twice, then you have a uh, variation of Ricci, variation of scalar. Um, yeah, after defining this uh, crazy expression, by the way, at, at some point I, I said, uh, th that is my Laplacian. So this is uh, the standard Lap Laplacian or uh, rough Laplacian plus some junk term. This is so-called uh, Lisnori. How to pronounce this? Lisnero. Lisnori. Uh, Laplacian. And then this is the variation for R. And I defined a thing called gradient. This is the definition of gradient. Uh, so, uh, you define your action. And um, if you define your action in, and take the time derivative, evaluate a zero, then whatever function here you have, that is called a gradient. It's just the definition. Then again, you prove a couple of uh, lemma, just calculation. And after, after that, uh, you find the gradient of vial action is this nasty expression, is just the Laplacian. Um, yeah, and like uh, this double gradient, um, some other crazy junk term, and uh, this, uh, well, this 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 whole thing is like a mess. <laughs> uh, but the good thing is this mess is basically your Bach tensor in four dimension. If you see, if you want to see the coordinate expression of Bach tensor, this is this crazy, uh, this is this ugly uh, mess. Uh, I think Tibros at some point wanted to see this crazy expression. This is this crazy expression. And this crazy expression is your Bach in four dimension. And this is a gradient of something. Well, uh, uh, you know, like uh, if you're in the nice world, then something is uh, the, the divergence of gradient should be zero. Uh, the divergence of gradient should be zero. So this is sort of another proof, uh, another proof. Uh, um, yeah, uh, so this is sort of another proof. Uh, if you want to be fancy, if you want to be fancy, uh, then uh, you can um, uh, then you can use Charn Gauss Bonnet theorem one more time. Uh, finally, um, here we have a beautiful result. Uh, this results, uh, um, I sort of uh, um, I have been just reading this argument from uh, some paper. Uh, his Vyaklovsky. Um, um, it says uh, that uh, the Bach tensor is divergence free. It's not an accident. He said, like uh, after doing marathon computation, you found your Bach tensor is divergence free and four dimension and uh, Einstein tensor was divergence free is four dimension. These sort of results are not accident. He proved anything, if you have anything variation, if you have a variational thing, 
and uh, you define the way. Um, if you have anything variational, um, then I don't know how to write it. Um, if you have anything variational, uh, variational that have that guy has to be divergence free. Uh, it doesn't matter that guy is Einstein or Bach, whatever. And 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 this comes from purely differential geometric view, viewpoint. The main idea is you just use uh, diffeomorphism invariance. Um, that's, uh, um, I mean, th that was the basic result, baby lemma. Then uh, I proved the linearization of stability for Bach, Bach equation. Uh, I'm skipping the definition. I believe you guys know the definition. So I proved this couple of results. Uh, so this is my real research. Um, uh, uh, like B is Bach tensor in four dimension. Suppose your B is zero. Um, uh, so GT is one parameter family of metric. And if H is any symmetric, t uh, symmetric two tensor, then uh, if you apply the symmetric tensor on the linearized, um, linearized Bach tensor and you and you take the divergence, that guy is zero. Well, very roughly speaking, uh, we know that Bach tensor is uh, a Bach tensor is divergence free. This lemma fourteen is lemma fourteen tells you the linearized divergence operator is also also divergence free. Uh, it is not obvious at all. Um, uh, it comes from the divergence free of a Bach. Um, um, and uh, the second result is uh, if if you know that for a given metric, uh, if you uh, if, if you have a metric uh, such that a Bach is identically zero and uh, and H is a corresponding um, linearized solution, uh, then um, the second variation then the second variation of Bach is divergence free uh, uh, and the, the proof is not difficult. Uh, it just um, like uh, Leibniz rule or product rule twice. It's not difficult. Like uh, things become automatic whenever you can prove uh, the divergence free of a bar. After this result, uh, the, the proposition three, which is a beautiful result, um, if your Bach is zero and the linearized Bach is, and H is a solution of linearized Bach and X is a killing vector field of your metric G, then you define a, a um, uh, you define a vector field. Well, technically it's not a vector field. It should be called co-vector field. I guess uh, like um, you guys are physicists, you should be happy that happy with that. Whenever you have a like nice metric, I mean that by nice, I mean if it is like non-degenerate, then uh, vector field and co-vector field are like same, roughly speaking. Like you can raise and lower indices. So I said uh, vector field. Uh, it should be. It should. I should say one form or co-vector field. And you can prove that guy is also uh, that guy has zero divergence. And again, uh, uh, the proof is uh, silly. Uh, it comes from the fact uh, if you um, if you have a uh, um, I don't know uh, you guys should be comfortable with baby differential geometry. If you, if you have a like killing field, then uh, the one of the cross, uh, uh, one of the consequence of killing vector field is uh, the gradient of x with respect to coordinate is like anti-symmetric. Sorry, I'm being um, sloppy. Uh, and then you can prove if you have a symmetric two tensor, if you trace it by any other uh, entry symmetric two tensor, that guy has to be identically zero. So this is the argument why uh, this a T tensor has zero divergence. This is so-called top quantity. Top was a physicist. Uh, I'm going to skip Sorry, uh, one result. I have a question here regarding the Please. killing vector field. So in general. Please. A Lorentzian manifold doesn't admit a killing vector field. So are you constraining your Lorentzian manifold to those which yeah, yeah, I'm like yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm just forcing, yeah. I'm forcing, yeah. Yeah. I'm forcing that guy has um uh, so that like they prove uh, like and the question is why I'm doing this. Uh the fisherman Mars Jenner, uh they proved uh this result. In both cases, without absence of killing field, and uh, like if we have a killing field, the result is true. The result. So um, uh, the the theorem was: if you don't have any killing field, then um, uh, Einstein um, 
then Einstein field equation is always linearized into stable. Like no killing field equ is equivalent to uh, linearization stable linearization stability of Bach equations. Uh, this is my conjecture, to be honest. I don't. Uh, I couldn't prove that part. Uh, I, I couldn't prove that part. The Bach equation is linearization stable if there is no killing field. field. This is one of my conjectures. This is uh, I and my advisor who strongly believe that has to be true. And our guess is instead of working with killing field, maybe conformal killing field should work. Um, so this is one of our conjectures. Uh, this is our future goal. Uh, but in this uh, uh, in this article, in this stage, uh, we are restricting our uh, situation when we have a killing field, uh, at least one killing field. This is a restriction. Okay. Um, after proving this, baby, proposition three is just like silly tensor calculus thing. And lemma 16, that's sort of, um, sort of my main result. Um, so if you, uh, this is, uh, this, this, uh, this is uh, some killing, uh, killing field, and this is the linearization of Bach tensor, and uh, uh, this is some vector field. I, I, I should say co-vector co field, and you take the integral over some three-dimensional slice. Well, um, I mean, a, a three-dimensional slice is compact, um, a Cauchy, like people say Cauchy. Uh, by Cauchy, I guess you understand. Like there are a bunch of three-dimensional slices. They form this whole space time and like um so I guess uh, like just you understand. do you mean just a compact hypersurface or compact cauchy hypersurface? Which one? Uh like um uh, compact cauchy hyper hypersurface. I, I mean uh, uh uh I mean in future uh I need uh, cauchy, but right now I don't need cauchy. Some of the result for some of the result I need cauchy. But for this result, cauchy is irrelevant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we're further restricting your space time geometry. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, finding uh, some beautiful results is not free. <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, existence yeah. of Cauchy hypersurface has very strong motivation in mathematical GR and from also from physics point of view. Because if you look at yeah. Einstein equation, uh, it, it is well post only if it is globally hyperbolic and then. Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, also the, the for the the best thing about like uh your um like all all those equa Einstein equation, Bach equation, they become your just constraint equation, like the like so called constraint equation on the four slice. Then, I mean, life becomes much easier whenever you have like Riemannian setting. No, no, but in Riemannian oh, setting, you don't have Cauchy hypersurface. No, I mean, I mean, like whenever, like whenever you do on the slice, on the slice you have Riemannian ah, okay. metric. That's I mean, you I restrict everything on Cauchy hypersurface, so that means you are further yeah. restricting your Lorentzian manifold. So it's basically yeah. static space time. So you are considering actually static space time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, I defined a thing called like a uh, top, like uh, uh, I'll, I'll give some very precise name. Uh, I'm still thinking what should be the better kind of name. So Q is like some sort of quantity. I don't know what should be a better symbol. Maybe I'll give some symbol later before I publish. Uh, so this is my um, linearized Bach tensor uh, contracted with some killing vector field. This is the one form slash uh, vector field. And if you integral, if you take the integral over three dimensional slice, then your this integral will be zero. And the proof is honestly like two or three lines argument, it comes from generalized divergence theorem. I'm gonna skip the proof. And finally, after um finally you prove um you prove uh so this is uh so far uh this is the result we did so far. Uh, this is the one part of our dream result which is, um, this is my Bach equation and uh, X is a killing vector field, this is a restriction, then H is a solution to linearized Bach equation. So that basically means uh, dBGH is zero and uh, suppose H is integrable. By, whenever I say H is integrable, that means there exists a, uh, uh, very roughly speaking, whenever I say H is integrable, that means H can be approximate to generate um, actual solution to the Bach equation, very naively speaking. 
that's the meaning of integrable. Or, or another way of saying uh, 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 this little g is linearization is stable. If g is linearization is stable, then this quantity has to be uh, this quantity has to be um, identically zero over any uh, compact space like hypersurface. And uh, proofs from um, follows from previous result. Um, and you need to apply divergence theorem uh, one more time. Yeah, so this is uh, this is the necessary condition. If our metric G is linearization is stable, then certain uh, quantity has to be preserved, and uh, this is our quantity. This is uh, uh, um, uh, this quantity is uh, has to be preserved, and um, and uh, our conjecture. This is our con second conjecture. Is this is basically su sufficient if we know that this quantity vanishes, uh, this conserved quantity vanishes over any space-like surface, then G has to be integrable. This is our uh, conjecture. So in this and we yes, have some sort of are. intuitive argument why this has to be true, but um, um, but I, 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 like uh, we don't know the proof, but we have some sort of intuitive way of thinking why it has to be true. It comes from some, uh, so whole, uh, I don't know, maybe sometime, sometime I can talk. This whole problem can be uh, translated in like complex in the uh, algebraic topology sense. Um, anyways, maybe, maybe, maybe I can talk about some other time. Anyways, um, so this is basically the story um, so far. Um, um, uh, yeah, so what I said, our next goal is to prove um, uh, the conjecture uh, 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 the conjecture absence of killing field Bach equation should be uh, always integrable. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. So this is I, I know it sounds uh, uh, pretty optimistic, uh, but we have some sort of um, argument why that has to be the case. And our second uh, second conjecture is um, whatever I did, uh, which is necessary. Uh, should be sufficient. Um, uh, anyways, folks, I was, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, it was not a good talk. And uh, I, I said a lot of things uh, which was not precise. Um, you know, like if you are interested, maybe next time I can dedicatedly talk about conformal geometry. And I'm going to stop now. Thanks. Okay, so thank you uh, for your nice talk. And uh, so Tibur sir has to leave, as he told you. Also, Paul sir has to leave because he has to go to his village. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for the nice introductory and pedagogical talk. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was just going to say that as a physicist, at least I'm not too concerned about being very precise about various statements. <laughs> Yeah, and neither me. I mean, uh, uh, I, I am also most interested in big pictures, uh, not really right. um, theorem, propositions, lemma. Sorry to say, <laughs> that's that's not my type. <laughs> no, so uh, I have um, like one broad question, which is that: so is that what you are studying? Is it basically um, the stability of solutions uh, of in conformal gravity? Uh... Yeah. So uh, right, but so yeah, yeah. You, you derive the Bach yeah, equation yeah. from varying the uh, square of yeah, the volume, yeah, right? right? So that's right, right. That's one of the actions that people use in conformal gravity. So you're right. basically studying uh, solutions of of right. a particular model right. of conformal gravity, right? Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Right. And so from there, do we learn something about stability of solutions in Einstein gravity? Oh, oh so um, it is already done. Um, it's, it's already done. Um, like um, people publish like dozens of paper. Um, so whenever you have like empty space Einstein equation without any cosmological constant, um, mm -hmm. like uh, you pretty much know all the cages when uh, any metric is linearization stable. Like, yeah, everything is. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. And uh, I see. Like Bach case is. Uh, uh, um, 
Yeah, some people is still working on Bach. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether people will publish before me. Yeah. So the Einstein um, Einstein case okay. is solved. And are, are there weird gravitational solutions in conformal gravity? By weird, I mean singular, like black hole sort of things. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, um, I don't know. So there, there, there are some uh, uh, like a couple of years ago, someone uh, gave explicit solution of Bach equation that does not satisfy Einstein equation. I don't know that is hmm. weird or not. Uh, okay. Yeah, but oh, that's interesting. But, but but people found explicit solution to Bach equation. Those are not like um, Einstein or Ricci flat. I see. Okay. Maybe 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 you could say they're like weird because. Things mm -hmm. not not Einstein or and, flat. Right. Uh, another question is, well, it's not exactly directly related to this, I suppose, or maybe. Um, so, if I have some uh, quantum field theory coupled to ordinary Einstein gravity, um, then I can expect that at low energy, I should find some. Well, let's assume that at low energy, the field theory is not trivial; it becomes some conformal, conformal field theory. Then I should find some conformal field theory coupled to presumably conformal gravity. Um, then there, there are different models of both Einstein gravity. I mean, there are different models of gravity and different models of conformal gravity. Do we know which gravitational model flows to which conformal gravitational model in the IR? Uh, I don't know the answer. I am sorry. Maybe. Okay. Can, can yeah, I guess it was a physics question. Too much physics, uh, but, uh, uh, anyway, okay. Any, 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 <laughs> anybody fine. wants to answer? Uh, sorry, yeah, I need to learn some physics to be very honest. Like I'm, uh, like um, yeah, not not uh, like yeah. I, I, that's why I'm connected with you guys. I need to learn some physics. Well, I mean, and... I know the exact answer, uh, but there are some okay. which tells that uh, okay. In general, I don't know whether it's possible. Okay. But uh, if you do, so you are basically asking conformal semi-classical gravity, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So then you can study, of course, conformal semi-classical gravity. But in mm -hmm. there, in this setting, you usually start from a like a fixed gravitational field. So your Lorentzian manifold is given. And then you put quantum fields on top of that Lorentzian manifold. So uh, from see, okay. study, uh, you 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 can talk about like back reaction and this sort of thing, but not really. Mm -hmm. At least what I know, and of course I don't mm. know. Uh, very tiny. I mean, I know only very tiny stuff of thing, but uh, there you can study black hole and uh, this back reaction, this sort of thing. And then also mm -hmm. stability of the semi-classical Einstein equation, which is in these days a quite active field people are doing. Okay. Uh, and there are a few results, but in general, like a great generality, you know, there are mostly like model, okay? You take maybe stationary solution, okay? Or spherically symmetric, uh -huh. this, this sort of study people are doing. And uh, it's okay. still ongoing. I think I, I saw some paper even last year. I see. And right, okay. for, Thank you. for like, if you take just classical gravity, uh, mm -hmm. still then uh, people are also looking at uh, stability of Einstein equation, which is currently a very hot field in PDE, mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. relativity. So a few years back, I think 2018, maybe around, I, I can remember exactly, there was a quite big result in this direction, like, Linearized D sitter is stable. And I think ah, okay. the man and his collaborator has proven D sitter in nonlinearity is also stable. It's a huge proof. Of course, I didn't ah. care to look at their work, but I just knew uh, this they, they, okay, they okay. had this great result. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and also from coupled, uh, like like the semi-classical viewpoint, there are also some stability result on, uh, again, some specific cases like stationary, mostly I think stationary. Okay, all right, thank you. I mean, these are very interesting results, but unfortunately I'm not very up to date on these things. Yeah. Okay. 
Thanks. I mean, I also don't exactly work uh, in uh, say nonlinear PDE. Uh, I, I am mm. so far have work and working still on linear PDE. Uh, but mm. this is a really very exciting field, especially yeah, yeah. Digit, they have some very brilliant results. So yeah, time to time, sometimes meet people in conference and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, this thing seems extremely complicated. I mean, yeah, yeah very complicated. <laughs> I can't imagine. Very few people in the world actually are producing this result because it really needs very uh, sophisticated level of technical knowledge. And, right. Uh, so there are only very few groups actually. So either they report something mm -hmm. or some other group. It's not like. At least uh, I follow a bit, uh, say, mm -hmm. lively, and I never saw any significant result, even not big, anyone apart from those groups. So okay. fairly closed, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. community. Uh, I mean, not closed community, I'm not judging them, but the results, at least the way it's producing. So, mm. yeah.